Let's address the employment issue and the three schemes that you spoke of. And, uh, uh, you know, we just had the uh, finance secretary here explaining to us that there are design challenges and a lot of this is going to be work in progress uh, between how MCA works on it, uh, uh, what the Labor Ministry decides to do as far as two of those schemes are concerned. Explain to us how the DPIIT can perhaps also uh, facilitate uh, the movement on these three schemes. Uh, frankly, Shireen, I will not be able to speak much about the design and the architecture of the scheme because right now we are really talking about a budget announcement mm. which has to be now fleshed out in the form of a scheme and detailed guidelines. The way the initial structure looks like, a lot of the DBT, the uh, architecture, the reimbursement to the through, F, uh, through the EFPO, all of that should go naturally to the Labor Department. Mm which could probably end up running the bulk of the scheme. But I, I really don't think we've reached the stage where we can you know, start talking about the detailed structure, since I don't think it has really been worked out through the process of interministerial consultations. So th that's still work in progress. Mr. Krishnan, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the economic survey highlighted as a potential concern uh, was the world that we move into, which is an AI-driven world and the impact of that as far as jobs are concerned. But let me link that now to the objective of skilling, which the government has put forward as far as the budget is concerned. You know, where do you believe the gaps lie? Where do you believe the industry government compact will more effectively work? What would you like to see happen on that front, uh, given given the many objectives that you're looking at at this point in time? See, I think uh, what the economic survey had to say about AI and the risks that it poses, uh, I think it is a very, very well analyzed and uh, very well written uh, segment of the economic survey. It brings out all the risks clearly. And it also highlights that the risks for a country like India are significantly lower and the opportunities are significantly better than what it is for many other parts of the world, including the developed parts of the world. And I think that is something we need to recognize. When you read it more carefully, you mm. realize that that is what they are actually highlighting, that India has a huge opportunity in mm. this space. And for that, skilling India's population so that they are able to work more effectively with AI, their productivity goes up by using AI, and we can actually serve as the AI back office for the rest of the world as well as an opportunity that we need to really wade into. And that would mean that uh, clearly, you know, curriculum development and a lot of those aspects and how it is uh, how it is taught in various colleges and universities and how people are familiarized with it is critical. And that is something that the India AI mission, which is cleared just before yeah. the budget, yeah. uh, specifically addresses. The other part of it is to make sure that uh, adequate access is available to AI compute facility within mm. the country, and that's a very significant chunk of the allocation for the India AI mission. So I think a combination of all this will make India fairly AI ready. Mm. And in any case, even the Stanford AI Index and others do highlight that at least in terms of availability of uh, man, uh, human resources which can be skilled for yeah. AI, India stands pretty much at the top of the league. The PIT Secretary, I want to understand from you as far as FDI is concerned, and I think that was again something that uh, the economic survey highlighted, that it is a, uh, a you know challenging global environment. But uh, uh, you know, what's the indication now in terms of a pickup as far as FDI is concerned? Because you believe that uh, the numbers that we saw were an aberration, it was a blip, and that we would start to see a pickup. Uh, what is the sense that you get on that front? And I also want to get your comments on what the survey suggested, that we adopt a much more pragmatic approach when it comes to FDI from China and that that might be uh, a review as far as policy is concerned that the government ought to consider. Is that the DPIT's view too? What you'll find is that in the last three or four years, for the last five years, our average inflow would be gross FDI would be about $70 billion. Uh, we reached the highest ever figure of $84 billion in 22, 23. 22, 23 Thereafter, yes. we've been at around $71 billion the last two years. The concern that people had was primarily the fact that in the last year we had a lot of repatriation as a result of which the net FDI figure dipped significantly. Now that again, as the economic survey also points out, is not so much of an area of concern because it actually gives the investor the confidence that India is a market from which repatriation is not, a, is not an issue, a concern that sometimes does get expressed across the board, but this shows that we, mm. are, we are transparent, people are able to repatriate profits, book profits, mm. as and when they want. 
So that kind of a stability and predictability in your FDI regime, combined with the fact that we have one of the most liberal FDI regimes in the world, mm. and of course the overall compelling growth story that India has, makes us believe that we are going to be uh, looking at an average inflow of about gross inflow of about $100 billion plus in the next five years, if you look at averages. Now, coming to uh, uh, the PN3 issue, uh, that is, as you know, we do a government approval route for all PN3 yeah. cases. Uh, the suggestion is that we should uh, sort of uh, put uh, FDI uh, investment by Chinese companies at a premium over the trade dependence Correct. that we seem to have. Okay. Then it's a point of view. My personal view on this is that, first of all, FDI inflows from China have never been significant to India. Mm. If you look at it cumulatively, it is less than 1% of our cumulative FDI. But th there could be significant uh, uh, investment potential or usefulness to us in specific areas mm. and in specific technologies. Now, for looking at those, uh, taking a nuanced approach with respect to such proposals, mm. which where they have good technologies or where they are the most cost-effective technologies in yeah. the world, which is why there is a system, there is an interministerial sort of process mm. by which we take into account these cases on a on a one-to-one -one basis. And many of these cases do get cleared, where, where we feel that this is useful for us and we don't want to do a kind of self-harm by keeping that kind of investment out. But yeah, I mean, we can't do a blanket uh, sure. uh, sort of uh, opening of the door. We'll continue to follow the government route. But as I said, a nuanced approach by the government looking at the usefulness of that particular investment flow will be taken. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us here and giving us a very clear but comprehensive roadmap of the priorities as well as the focus areas that each of you are working on with regards to your respective ministries. We wish you the very best of luck. Uh, many of you have listed out some pretty ambitious targets here, and we hope that when we check back with you uh, that uh, there is a realization of the targets that you've set out here on CNBC TV 18. Many, many Many thanks to our viewers and our participants for joining us here uh, on TV, online, and of course here in the capital. Uh, this is a close on the CNBC TV 18 budget verdict for 2024. Remember, as I pointed out, this is the 10th year of us presenting to you the CNBC TV 18 budget verdict that analyzes the fine print with the budget makers and with key officials responsible for ensuring that those budget announcements and the budget promises are actually executed and taken forward. From all of us here on the team for now, goodbye and many thanks for watching.